Hello, everyone. Welcome to class number three in this series. Um, happy to see so many lovely faces. I see a lot of people here from all over. Got uh, Florida, Richmond, Virginia, Texas, New Jersey, uh, California. Welcome. Um, so happy to have you guys. And if you um, missed class number one or class number two, um, our moderator, Jimena, can uh, drop that in the chat, the links to the, the previous recordings on YouTube, and they're also on Michael's website under Fine Art. Um, last week in class number one, I definitely, or excuse me, last week in class number two, I definitely glossed over lots of things that were in class number one. And this week in class number three, I will be glossing over a lot of things from class number two. So if it seems like I've skipped over some information, um, I assure you, you will find that information on, um, on the previous class recordings. So check those out. And likewise, if you miss a step in the instruction this evening and uh, you want me to repeat something, um, just you know keep following along and be patient and you can check the, the website and YouTube for the recording of this class um, if you miss anything. So I don't want to repeat too much just for the sake of time. We're going to be building on skills from class number one. You can think of this as, uh, as if you just signed up for a year long drawing class for beginners. And we're going to be scaffolding, building skills uh, each week on top of the, the previous weeks uh, with some intermediate and advanced classes sprinkled in for more experienced artists. So uh, yeah, have to be aware of the folks not watching live and not repeat myself too much. So uh, I'm an artist and teacher uh, based in Austin, Texas. Uh, my professional work is very ethereal, cloud-based, based on dream states, uh, skyscapes and dreamscapes. And I also do a lot of portraiture. Uh, so if you wanna check out some of my personal work, uh, please follow me on Instagram or um, you can check out my website and all that can be found through my Instagram. I've got a link tree link with that you can click on and find out everything that I'm up to. I teach a lot of independent classes. I offer private lessons. So I'd love to hear from some of you guys um, if you want to find me uh, elsewhere. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and there's my my Instagram and my my business one of my business cards or a few of my business cards with my my Instagram and Facebook and email and all that good stuff. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and clear that out of the way. And yeah, please tag your work with the hashtags. Make it with Michael's or Michael's classes. Uh, you can even tag me um, on Instagram if you you post your work from the class. So tonight is part one in a two part series where we're going to be covering uh, shading techniques, alternative shading techniques. Uh, the standard shading technique is uh, tonal shading. And last week we talked all about tonal shading. I'm just looking for my, my tonal shading example here. Pardon me. So last week we talked about tonal shading, which is a smooth, continuous uh, blend. So yes, this is part one. Next week will be part two of alternative shading techniques. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about hatching and cross hatching. So even though this is class number three, it's just you know we only have an hour, so I can't cover all four of these alternative shading techniques in, in one hour, but I can cover two of them. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, hatching and cross hatching. And then next week will be part two of these uh, shading techniques. And we'll talk about stippling and scribbling. So stippling is the one with all the tiny little dots and scribbling is just like it sounds. So that will be in next week in part two of shading techniques. And this week we're going to be talking about hatching, which is a shading technique that is done with one directional lines. 
that follow the, the contours of a form. And if you don't know what contours are, or if you're unfamiliar with how to render a form, you can find that in class number one and uh, class number two. Uh, we talked a little bit more about that. Class number one, we talked about uh, rendering forms and uh, contours. And in class number two, we talked about tonal shading. Okay, uh, I said I wasn't going to repeat myself, and I already did because I keep seeing <laughs> those questions popping up in the chat. I'm going to try to Try not to repeat myself too much more. Um, and then cross hatching. So we've got hatching, which is the one directional lines. And then we've got cross hatching, which is um, multiple directional lines. So they go in multiple directions. They go up, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, and uh, but they all follow the contours of the form. So I will be kind of glossing over that since we covered it at length in uh, class number one especially, but a contour is all of the surfaces of a form. So a three-dimensional form, if we're talking about a sphere, we need lines, the, the contour lines need to curve and wrap all around the surface of the sphere, so they need to be curved all the way around. So you're looking for a C-curve with your lines to uh, create a sphere versus any type of lines that become flat can start to make us see something that's more two-dimensional or flat. And uh, that's not following the contours of a, a sphere. This would be an example on, um, we'll come back to this in just a moment when we start doing our hatching and cross hatching. But just to explain briefly about contours one more time, if we're talking about a flower petal, uh, if I were to suggest the value on this flower petal or the cross contour lines on this flower petal using straight lines, it's not going to be as effective in making it look three dimensional or making it look like a flower petal as if I followed the curves of the, the flower petal. Um, I also illustrated that in class number one talking about a cylinder, how on a cylinder you're going to have uh, vertical lines that are straight, but horizontal lines that are curved. Uh, if we were to have both uh, straight vertical and horizontal lines, we'd be talking about a rectangle or something that's flat, right? Um, and we're not going to get too much into perspective just yet. For these first several classes, I'm going to really stick to organic forms. Um, so far, we've been working with still life items like uh, pieces of fruit last week when we did, <clears throat> excuse me, the tonal shading, we uh, used a piece of fruit to do a tonal shading both with and without a ground. And my example with the ground is put away because it's a little bit messy, but that was the tonal shading without a ground. So if you missed that, that was uh, last week's class, uh, tonal shading with and without a ground was the title of that class. And then this is the example from class number one with the cross contour lines on, a, um, on an apple. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started here talking about hatching and cross hatching tonight. We're just focusing on those two. So you may have an example by the end of the hour that looks maybe something like this. Um, in the class uh, advertisement, there was an early stage of these two drawings. You might also have an, an earlier stage of some larger drawings. Um, but I asked folks to get in the supply list. I suggested uh, the Artist Loft brand sketching pencils. So I've got a set of 12 Artist Loft sketching pencils and uh, synthetic erasers. You don't need two, you just need one. I'm not sure why I have two here. Um, and then you need some sketching paper and you need uh, some organic still life items. So if you want to stick with fruit from the, the first couple of classes, you can, or if you want to grab a leaf or a flower, but we want to stick with something organic. So all we're covering tonight is uh, hatching and cross hatching shading techniques. So everything else that I just talked about can be found in the other two class recordings so far. Um, so I'm going to come back to the, my still life leaf in just a moment and get started 
with a value scale. So last week with the tonal shading, we started creating a value scale using tonal shading. Um, we're going to do the same thing this week with starting with hatching. So I'm going to take my pencil, any pencil, it doesn't matter which one you, you feel most comfortable starting with. We're going to draw a long skinny rectangle and actually draw two long skinny rectangles. We'll go ahead and do our hatching and cross hatching pretty much at the same time. I'm going to use a darker pencil just so that you can see my um, my pencil lines on screen. So I'm just drawing a long skinny rectangle and then I'm drawing another long skinny rectangle and I'm going to label those hatching and cross hatching. And you can use honestly any pencil for this. You could even use a pen. So if you don't have the artist loft uh, sketching pencils, then uh, just use whatever you have handy. So I'm going to label my value scale 0 to 10. I'm not going to label it all the way 1 through 10. I'm just going to put a 0 and a 10 and maybe a 5 in the middle. You don't have to have 10 values. So values are the shift from light to dark. So the shadows and the light on whatever you are drawing, you're always going to have the full spectrum of light when you're observing any object. So any object, still life object, or any subject matter that you're drawing, you're going to have a shadow that's going to be absolute black, absolute dark, and then you're going to have some absolute white highlights on on your object. You may not have a shadow that goes all the way to black, but typically you're going to have at least, you know, some shadows that you're seeing that are absolute black or dark. So you want to account for how to make that occur in your drawing using the shading techniques. With tonal shading, we just sort of blend. We can do that very easily with a pencil. Uh, if you have a pen, uh, you can't use tonal shading. You can't do that soft, continuous, smooth tonal shading like we did in last week's class. You're forced to make one mark at a time if you're using uh, a pen, but you can use do hatching with a pencil or anything. So it's just one directional lines. So I'm going to start with just vertical lines here, and I want to overlap those lines until I get to a solid black dark. So we're looking for our absolute black. So you definitely want to use one of your B pencils for this. You could do this with your 2B if that's all that you have, but you would do much better if you had a, a 5B, a 6B, or even a 4B, because that 2B maybe you'd have to really put a lot of pressure on your pencil to get it to an absolute black. So I'm overlapping my lines and I'm using more pressure to get to an absolute black. I don't want any paper showing through to make that happen. And then sometimes it's kind of hard to make this happen gradually. So I like to jump to my medium five and make lines that are sort of medium gray and uh, medium pressure on my pencil and evenly spaced lines. And then I can start to meet myself in the middle here. So I can do that all the way down because I know between six and 10, it's going to get darker than the five. So I can just keep overlapping and sort of blend that way. So a lot of people will ask, why do you do this shading technique if in the end it ends up looking like tonal shading with um, when you're using a pencil because it is hard to distinguish between one end of this value scale when it's nice and dark like that and what the value scale looks like using tonal shading, right? 
But when you apply that to a subject, when you apply this hatching technique to a subject, it gives it a certain character, a certain quality. It definitely helps to follow the contours of the forms. There's a lot of benefits in using the shading techniques with a pencil. And like I said, if you're using a, a pen, you have no choice but to use one of these shading techniques. Um, but when it comes to using graphite and these alternative shading techniques, it's just another tool to have in your tool belt when adding value to a form. So I'm continuing to overlap my, okay. yes. Sorry, I, we have a question from Margaret. So would these shading te techniques be used only for shadows or can they be used for drawing an object as well? Um, yes, every object that we look at, everything in the world, we can only see it because it is being illuminated by light and where there is light, there is shadow, right? We, if we were to have a, um, a room with no windows, and no lights on, the door is closed, and it's pitch black dark in the room, and I were to light a match, you're only going to see me based on that match, where that mat, you're only going to see maybe half of my face, so it's closest to the flame. Uh, you're going to see a lot of stuff in shadow because it's a dark room except for the one flame. So everything that we look at, we're seeing it because of there's some amount of light that is falling on it, right? Otherwise we wouldn't be able to see it. It would be in complete dark. So you're using these shading techniques to draw um, everything. I mean, value, light and dark is, there. I mean, there, there's lots of things that go into creating a work of art and to creating a, um, a visual representation of what we see in the world or an optical illusion, if you will, on the page. But um, value is definitely one of the most important things. So that's why uh, I'm starting with it in this, this series. Um, last week talked about tonal value shading and then now this, because I think understanding how to apply value light and dark uh, to a form and especially understanding the contours of a form, what makes something look three-dimensional, like I talked about those, uh, those contour lines just a moment ago. So our value is hugging the curves of the form, following whatever the contours of the form are doing. If the uh, form is flat, then our value or our shadows are going to be flat, our value and our light. It's not just the shadows. The light is not going to be you know, absolute bright searing light on it, right? It's going to have some variation in it where you're gonna see a very light, light um, tone and you're gonna see, you know, you're gonna have highlights that are, that are light in a varying degree. So hopefully that answered that question. Good question. Um, just understanding and observing light, it can take up a, a lot of space in an art practice. So I'm just gradually, letting up on my pressure in how I'm uh, putting those vertical lines down and then I'm spacing them out until I get to you know about a medium there and then to get my lighter values and I did just use one pencil all the way down you might switch um, it may be hard for uh, beginners to let up on their pressure on the pencil and if you're struggling with that in class number one we talked about holding our pencil uh, towards the back and parallel to the paper so that you can uh, relieve the pressure that you're putting on the pencil but you would want to use your b pencils your softer darker pencils for um, the, the darker values your five through tens and then you're going to switch to your h pencils for your lighter values. And so as the numbers get higher on those H pencils, the pencils are becoming lighter. So I'm using a 2H now. And then if I switch to a 3H or a 4H or a 5H, I'm gonna be able to get even lighter lines. And I want my one, my ones and twos on this value scale to be even lighter then my threes and my fours and my fives. And if it's hard to see, um, it's because I'm doing it right. So maybe kind of hard to see on the screen, but it is lighter and lighter until we get to that zero, which would be the blank paper or your absolute white highlight. 
So I'm just going to label that your white highlight or blank paper. If you were doing a tone, you would like we did last week in class number two, you could erase that out to get to that absolute highlight. Okay, and then cross hatching is going to be very similar to uh, hatching, only instead of just one directional lines, we're looking for multiple directional lines. So our lines are going to go, we're gonna crisscross, uh, go diagonal. So I'm gonna start with, I've got my 6B here, which I sharpened last week using a blade in uh, class number two. And I did that so that I could create a tone with it. So that's in class number two, tonal shading with and without a ground where I show how to sharpen a pencil with a blade. Um, so I'm using cross directional lines here. So I'm started with my vertical lines, just like I started with the hatching, but now I'm gonna shift to horizontal lines as well maybe some diagonal lines. So for the purpose of this value scale, all we are doing is getting a feel for the full value scale using these shading techniques. This is just our practice. So for the medium here, and it's fine if your value scale is not perfect, it's fine if you don't have exactly 10 uh, separate values, we just wanna get a sense from light to dark. As long as you have accounted for uh, blank paper or absolute white on one end and absolute black on the other end with a medium uh, value of in the middle, then you are good. So I like to do my cross hatching value scale, just kind of drag it down the whole thing all at once and then meet myself somewhere in the middle with my pressure and overlapping. Uh, once heard somebody say that Everything in art is just a matter of patience and pressure. And I really related to that, that comment because I feel like when it comes to art making, for me, patience is very key and also the amount of pressure that I'm putting on my, my materials has a lot to do with what's happening on the page. So I just sort of let up on my pressure as I drifted down the value scale there. And now I'm going back and overlapping to get my, my darker values to happen. I'm switching up the direction of my lines a lot here. And I wanna overlap until there's no paper showing through on the, the 10 portion of the value scale. So, and I'm just using my 6B all the way down. If you're having problems letting up on your pressure, then just shift your, your pencils that you're using. So go use your 6B for your 10, use your 4B for your kind of eight or nines on the value scale, your 4Bs and your 2Bs for the uh, five and six on the value scale. And then you'll use your H pencils on the lighter side. And if you're confused about the numbers and letters on the pencils, I spent a lot of time in class number one just talking about the graphite pencils and explaining what these numbers mean. So uh, a 4H is going to be lighter than a 2H is essentially all you need to know at this time. So I'm going to go the opposite way now. I'm going to use my 4H for my lighter values there. And I'm just adding pressure here and then I'll go to a maybe 2H or a B even might blend those nicely. Another way that you can suggest lighter values using hatching and cross hatching is to uh, use more of an implied line. So maybe you don't draw as much of a full line. You kind of let the line fade away. And I'll definitely be talking more about implied line in a, a later class. I'm just gonna be focusing on one or two skills in each one of these hour long classes. So 
uh, if there's something I bring up that I haven't gotten to yet, then just stay tuned on Wednesday evenings. Um, and then there actually will be some other classes on Thursdays and Sundays this month, but typically these classes are going to be happening on um, Wednesdays, Wednesday evenings. Okay, so that is our hatching and cross hatching value scales. Did anybody have any questions or any concerns with how their value scales came out that they want to share or talk about? I know there's yes. a lot of <laughs> So we, we have a couple of questions here. Um, one question is, um, do you know why it's called hatching? Is there a reason for that? That is a very good question. I do not. Um, I'm going to look that up later. Awesome. I love <laughs> okay. I if anybody knows in the it. audience, um, feel free to put it in the chat. I, you know what? I bet it is. It probably has something to do with um, printmaking because uh, all of these shading techniques are what you're required to use when you're doing any kind of printmaking because you have to carve into a surface either of a block of either wood, you know, you know, a wood block and talio is like a um, copper plate. So I would imagine when you're doing that, it's almost like, you know, or, you know, the lines that you make to like tick off days, you know, you always see that in the movies, like somebody's marking the days on the, the wall, they do that. Maybe that's referred to as hatching and that's similar. And then with cross hatching, you're, you're crossing over it. It may, may very well be. Um... Anyway, let's move on to the next question. Um, this is from Mia. So she'd like to know, when is it best to use um, to use hatching versus cross hatching? Okay, great question. Yeah, uh, we're definitely gonna cover that as we move forward uh, with our still life items. Okay, perfect. And I saw it said in the chat, hatching is on the dollar bill because that's uh, a print, you know, they are a lot of, you know, art that we, we see, especially from, you know, previous to, what am I trying to say, from a certain era is you're looking at prints that were made with either, um, oh my gosh, I see my mom just commented, hatching is an artistic technique. Did she copy that from Google? <laughs> All right, there it is. My mom just dropped it in the chat. I saw uh, Lisa Detmore <laughs> with the... The definition of hatching um, but yeah I, I teach a pen and ink class uh, that I've been teaching for the last 70 years here in Austin uh, at the Doherty Arts Center and uh, I always talk about at the beginning of the pen and ink class the the history of printmaking because all of these shading techniques are what you rely on when you're carving with a point into a, a block but yeah and engraving thank you it's blanking on the word engraving that's what's on a dollar bill Okay, so moving on to our still life items, unless there's any more. Great Sorry, questions. Adrian, just real fast before we move on, could you bring it up to the um, to the camera just a little bit so um, yeah. they can see the detail? Mm -hmm. And while you do that, um, can you use an eraser to lighten the lines? Yeah, you can definitely lighten the lines with an eraser, definitely. Um, but like last week with the, the tonal shading, I talked about all the different materials that you can use to help you with the tonal shading, like the, the blending stumps and the tortillions. I definitely challenge you to try to achieve those lighter values with your H pencils and light pressure versus erasing them out because, you know, then you're just going to get better at, at blending your technique. But when you're starting out, if you're having a hard time, you know, achieving a lighter level of hatching, definitely, you know, erase it to make it appear lighter. Good question. Perfect. And just last question before we move on. Um, is, is, do you have any tips to avoid smudges? Um, yes, you can, and especially if you're left-handed like me, I just smudged my drawing all around. You can take a, another sheet of paper, an extra piece of paper and put it underneath your hand to keep you from, from smudging or, um, which I could probably stand to do a little bit more of. Um, like when I worked on these, I definitely had an extra piece of paper just underneath my hand so that I wouldn't uh, smudge. I was also going kind of fast just then. And if I was, you know, just sitting at my desk without 
468 people watching what I was doing, I would probably just take my time not to rush so that I wouldn't smudge as much. I saw somebody said they use a glove. Um, I definitely will position my hand in a certain way when I'm being extra patient. Um, sometimes I'll kind of steady myself with my pinky so that I don't have to rest my hand on the, the paper. Uh, and also holding your pencil at that angle so that your strength is coming from your bicep. So again, go back and watch class number one if you missed that about just how we're holding the art pencils. They make a big difference in every mark that we make on the page. So um, patience and pressure again. Um, okay, so I'm gonna use a leaf for my, my still life object here. So hopefully everybody has their still life object handy. Um, and yeah, if you wanna grab an extra sheet of paper, maybe I will tear off an extra sheet and have that rest my hand on in case I'm just on a smudging streak tonight. Um, so yeah, a, a rose, I saw someone said in the chat, any any organic form. We're gonna get into linear perspective later on in this series. So for all of these initial classes, I'm gonna be focusing on techniques that you can do with uh, organic forms so that we're not even worrying about linear perspective. I know a couple people had a coffee mug as their still life item in the, the previous classes and maybe you struggled with the perspective on that because that's a geometric form that's happening there. We've got some linear perspective recurring on a, a coffee mug. Uh, anything that's got a geometric form to it is going to, you're going to be introducing linear perspective. So stay tuned. I believe I've got that planned for class number eight or nine in this series where I'll start talking about linear perspective and that will definitely take up several classes. Uh, and it looks like Jimena just put the links for the, the previous classes in the chat. So if you guys wanted to go click on those and save them for easy reference later, that would be good. Um, so I'm gonna kind of gloss over getting started on this this form, just since that's what I covered in class number one and two, and I'm just gonna uh, go ahead and sketch my my leaf here, my outer lines, my overall lines of the leaf. I'm using just a B pencil, and I'm not worried necessarily about capturing this particular leaf's perfect shape when it comes to organic forms. I love to tell students. You know, it doesn't have to look like that cloud. It just has to look like a cloud or it doesn't have to look like that leaf or that rose or that shell. It just has to look like a shell or rose or leaf, right? Or maybe it doesn't have to look like anything. It depends on what your personal goal is in your art practice. I'm assuming if you're here, it's because you want to get better at rendering realistic forms. And that's definitely what I'm, doing so far is helping you build those beginning art skills, learning to look and draw from observation. But if you want to insert your own style into everything that you do, I highly encourage that because, you know, what's the point of making art if we're not doing that? Honestly, I think if you wanted it to look photorealistic, you could just take a photo. There is something satisfying about being able to draw something to look photorealistic, but even with these, I think they look very realistic, but I feel like they have an artist touch to them. They've got some of my style coming into them. Definitely that stippling one is starting to do the ethereal spacey thing that I do in a lot of my work. And the scribbling one is nice and loose and has a, a character or a style coming into it. So just embrace what, whatever's happening. Um, meet yourself where you, you are. Try not to judge yourself too much on where you, you aren't yet in your drawing practice and enjoy the journey, right? But uh, for now, I'm just sketching my outer shape of my leaf. It's not, like I said, perfectly rendering that shape of that leaf, but that's my outline. And then I've got this vertical line that's going down the, the center of it or that diagonal line. Okay, so now I am gonna be referring a lot to, to things from class number one. We talked about 
finding the um, organic shape of light and dark values. We talked about that last week a little bit as well, and also finding the uh, imperfections or unique aspects of your, your leaf or your organic form that make it different from other pieces of fruit or leaves. So mapping out those imperfections, so these little you know, discolorations in the leaf or uh, little brown spots, those are going to help anchor me in where I am as I'm starting to add my, my hatching. So I'm just going to use hatching on this first still life sketch. And then in the second sketch of this leaf, I'm going to use the leaf for both of them. I'm going to use cross hatching. So you can always mix these. There's no rule that says you can only use hatching or you can only use cross hatching. I just want you to challenge yourself right now to only use hatching just to get a feel for it. So we just did it on the value scale. Now we're going to try to apply that to our still life object. But if you challenge yourself to only use hatching, you're definitely going to get a nice sense of how to do it by the, the end of the sketch. So I'm putting in those other little veins that I'm seeing in the leaf and I'm making sure that I'm curving those lines because if I were to sketch them just straight, that's not following the contours of the form of the leaf. It does curve, it is three dimensional. It's not totally flat. There's a little bubble right there. And so uh, the elevational curve that happens is it comes up and it curves back down. So really take the time to look at your your form and find those cross contour lines. And that's what we did in class number one. If you're struggling with that, you can go back and check that out. Um, but I'm just applying that same notion here. So I'm curving my lines and following the contours of my leaf, just getting my basic idea of the, the contours down. So if I were to do that the other direction, that's what those, the direction of the curves that I'm seeing you know, I'm looking at it as horizontal, even though I've got it as an angle, but those would be my horizontals and these would be my verticals. They're curving that way on the horizontals and then on the verticals, there's a slight curve up right here. So I'm essentially just mapping it out for myself just, but since I'm only using one directional lines, I'm going to actually erase those cross contour lines because that might just confuse me, but I just wanted to illustrate that just so that everybody could see how I'm paying attention to that curve. So the way I'm going to illustrate that using just one directional lines is I'm going to notice how the light shifts on that vertical curve. So it's a little darker at the top here and it's lighter as it comes down. And so at the top, as I'm adding my hatching lines, I'm gonna make them a little bit darker and overlapping. So just like on the value scale and the darker shadows, they're overlapping, cl getting closer together. And then for the lighter values, I'll space them apart and use less pressure. And I maybe will just stick to one or two pencils the whole time because I'm pretty good at watching the pressure that I'm putting on each pencil, but you maybe want to switch around to all of your your B and H pencils so that you can, you know, get those darker values to happen if it's trickier for you to do it, you know, until you get more practiced with how you're applying your pressure. So I'm keeping my lines one directional, which is really hard. Every time I do this exercise this way, I get a little moment where my brain kind of short circuits, where it's really hard for me to illustrate the entire thing in just one directional lines. So I did that here and I only used vertical lines on the petals, or I guess they become horizontal there but I only used one directional lines there. I only used one directional lines for the background. And even though it's tiny, I used one directional lines for all of those little uh, details inside of the, the pistil of the flower. So it can be done. It's just a stretch, 
But when you challenge yourself to do this exercise, you will definitely come out of it with a better understanding of how to apply hatching and cross hatching. Okay, so somebody asked a minute ago the great question, how do you know when to use hatching and when to use cross hatching? It is kind of up to you. It's your preference, um, but it also depends on what you're drawing. Like when I was drawing these four flowers, I definitely made a conscious decision to use stippling the one dots at a time for the iris because the iris is such a, a delicate flower and it was it was a white iris so it was very white and pale and all of my values you know it just seemed like the one dot at a time so we'll be talking about these next week in class number two that it, it warranted the stippling and with the hatching I looked at the petals on this flower and I saw actual hatching lines. So same thing with this leaf. Um, I see hatching lines just on the leaf itself. So it's kind of a, a no brainer to use hatching. But like I said, there's no rule that says you can't combine all four of these shading techniques. There's no shading technique police that's going to show up and say, I see you rendered that form with both hatching, cross hatching, stippling, and also scribbling which is more than both, but that's not gonna happen. Do whatever you want. Um, but for this exercise, I'm just saying use hatching only. And I'm also not gonna come bust you if you, if you, you know, use cross hatching on this, or if you start to mix in some tonal shading from last week in there, if you get frustrated with the hatching technique. Um, I just want you to practice putting the value in using one directional lines to train your brain to do something it's not used to doing. It will help you understand value in general, and it will definitely help you with this shading technique. Because yeah, cross hatching is definitely one of my favorites and I'm having a really hard time sticking to one directional lines here. But it's forcing me to really apply that value in a conscious way. So I'm probably not going to finish this still life item just for the sake of time and I want to move on to the um, cross hatching technique. But that's why I said these small objects would probably be a better representation of what you can finish within this class period so or a partially finished drawing like what was advertised for the class. So this is all my one directional hatching lines on this little dried leaf that I sketched. So even though I change the direction of the hatching lines, it's still just one directional lines and they just curve with the contours of the form. So any questions about shading the still life item with hatching before I move on to cross hatching? We have one question about hatching. It's from Tina. She'd like to know um, when you're hatching, do you use your pencil or your do you hold your pencil your pencil closer to the point? Um. Yeah, I have a hard time being aware of when I'm holding my pencil closer to the point. Probably when I'm working on detail stuff, I'm holding it closer to the the point, and then whenever I'm like trying to capture the uh, overall sense of the form or lighter values, I probably pull back and hold my pencil farther back. But yeah, definitely when I'm doing fine details, I find myself holding it closer to the, the point. Even though I know I talked about in class number one, how it's so beneficial to hold it towards the back. Uh, but it, it really is all about that pressure and the reason why I was trying to encourage everyone in the first class to hold their pencil towards the back and to hold it at an angle is to relieve the amount of pressure that you're putting on it. Because if you're not, you know, if you're not as practiced and skilled as me, um, you, you might be putting more pressure on it, but I'm just very aware of the pressure. Sorry, that came out. So I was exaggerating my, my snobbiness there. I'm not really, I'm not really that snobby, really. Actually kind of am, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are like, alrighty then. Anyway, um, 
Yeah. We do have a couple more questions that just came in. Um, so do the pencil have, would you recommend the pencils being sharp for hatching? Um, yeah, definitely keep your pencil nice and sharp. It's going to help you with those, the lines of hatching for sure, because if it's not um, super sharp, then it would be hard to get your finer details to happen um, because you're just making a thicker line. So, and that's definitely the benefits of having your pencil sharpened like this with the blade because it exposes more of it. And then you can use your, I know this was not on the supply list this week, but since I have one handy like this, I can use my sand paper to sharpen it like that and get it to a nice fine point. And then I can get a lot of different variations with my lines because I've got a sharp point, but I've also got a thicker side of it. So I can apply my value in a variety of ways like that. Perfect. And we have a couple of people wondering, how would you go about doing the uh, drawing the shadow heavily? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, so it really depends on what the surface um, your your object is sitting on. So most of us are going to have it on a flat surface. So you're going to have you're going to want to suggest that the surface is flat, and the way that we do that is straight lines. So I like to just use pick a direction maybe the direction that the shadow seems to be falling like my shadow feels like it's falling in a line that i don't know i could have done it horizontally as well but i just picked vertical lines sort of like how i did on the the background shadow of um my other example how i used a horizontal line to create that shadow but I'm just going to use one directional line and just fill in the shape of that shadow. So essentially all value that you're adding, you're finding these organic shadow shapes. And we'll be talking about that in probably every class going forward, the shapes of shadows, the sh value shapes. Every time I teach a class, I always joke that my students probably get sick of me saying the words value shapes because if somebody you know, in a, a typical in-person class, after a lesson like this, I'll start walking around the room and giving, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one help to people in the class. I know we can't do that in, in this setting, but when I would do that, people would say, I'm having trouble making my, my leaf look three-dimensional right here. And it's like, okay, well, let's find the organic shape of the shadow that's happening right there. And maybe it's something like this. If I were to outline that organic shape, it looks like that. One uh, exercise that I like to use to help people find the unusual shapes is to just make your mind a complete blank and look at the shape of that shadow and ask yourself, what does that look like? Like, yes, I know it's the shadow on a leaf, but what else could that shape be? Like this shape right here of this shadow. In the chat, somebody tell me, what do you see? Like if we're looking at clouds in the sky, what else could this particular shape be? What does it look like? I'm seeing, okay, somebody said a mountain, good. Maybe a boomerang, um, a fin, a triangle, perfect, awesome. Okay, so do that with every unusual shape of shadow or shape of highlight because the highlights are just as important as the shadows um, and ask yourself what does that shape look like um, maybe it looks like a bean or a you know a noodle or i don't know whatever you're seeing and then you're filling in that shadow with whatever level of light and dark you need on your value scale so if i need a full 10 on my value scale for the shadow, then I'm just filling in the shape of that shark fin or that mountain or that boomerang shape with a with a 10. And then I'm done and I move on to something else. So do that with your, your unusual value shapes. Okay, so I'm, we're running out of time here. So let me move on to my cross hatching. Actually, I may just turn this one into cross hatching for the sake of time here. So I've already got my hatching. And if you want to do the same thing, you're welcome to. I mean, I could easily do that with 
any of my hatching examples, I could turn this into cross hatching. Here's my cross hatching example from this exercise with these little leaves. Um, so now I'm just free to put the cross directional values in there. So now I'm going to add my, I would, would start out exactly like I did with my hatching, but now I'm filling in the shape of that shadow using my cross directional lines. And so I've got a little bit more freedom and I love cross hatching. It's probably the one that I go to the most. It's definitely what you're going to see in all those engravings, like on a dollar bill or any old engravings that of art that you might be familiar with. So I'm looking for those organic shapes of shadows and light, and then I'm filling in those shadows using these shading techniques. So if it's hatching, I'm going one direction. If it's cross hatching, I'm going all different directions. I can do verticals, I can do diagonals. And it's in the shadow, I could go the other direction and really shift my, you know, make that look even more flat because when I do cross hatching right there, it definitely pushes the flatness of the surface of the, the table there, the, the paper surface. All right, I'm gonna switch to my H pencils and get some lighter values in here. I'm talking a lot about the shadows, but I'm not talking about the highlights. So it's just a shift in my pressure. I'm still curving with the contours of the form. I'm still looking for those irregular shapes of shadows and light. And then in these little details, I can get in here and do the same thing. So for that little brown spot, I'm gonna do some little cross hatching on that. The stem, didn't really work on this stem at all. I'm gonna exaggerate the shadows of the stem and really push the vertical and horizontal contours on that. I'm also going to push my outside lines a little bit. Not everything has to be a hatching and a cross hatching line on the drawing, but I can come off of the edge there with some little hatching and cross hatching details. And it's all about the details and the character. So if you've got like a cute little curve at the end of your leaf or those imperfections, put those in there, like focus on those for a while above everything else in your drawing, because that's what's going to really bring it to life and give it character. And all these little veins that are happening on my leaf. Definitely want those in there. And my leaf is definitely looking a little messy right now because I'm mapping out all these different parts of it, but I have to just trust that if I keep pushing my light and dark values using cross hatching here, that this is gonna come together. I've got four minutes left. try to impress you guys or I'll just pull out one of my other drawings and impress you with one of those again. <laughs> so yeah on here the way that I really made this come to life was definitely through really pushing that darkest shadow so that I created contrast and it, it popped against the the lighter shadow that's happening there so I'm just going to emphasize that how I curved right here with coming out of that shadow. Um, those details really can bring things to life. Also, if you've got two shadows falling across your uh, surface of your table, putting both of those in can really add another dimension to your drawing. So I've got my darker shadow here, and then I used an H pencil to do my lighter shadow that was being cast uh, across the, the table there. 
So doing something like that can really add character to the drawing. I'm going to try to focus on that throughout this series because uh, I know sometimes I have a tendency to get stuck on the, uh, the academic side of do's and don'ts, but I, I really want everyone to be embracing where they are in their own personal journey and their own personal practice and um, trying to put some unique flair or character into everything that you do. So try not to worry about making anything look perfect because that's a quick way to get very frustrated. And I just smudged my drawing up there. Okay, I wanna see what you guys did before we're done. So does anybody wanna share uh, their progress so far or their efforts? Uh, we maybe won't have completed drawings. We didn't expect to have completed drawings by the end of the class, but I wanna see your efforts. Um, can we spotlight any of these? I can spotlight, yeah. I'll, I'll spotlight a few. Okay. Oh, lovely. Yeah, look at that light and dark and that contrast. That's really just popping off of the page there. Wonderful. And then I'll go to another one over here. Ooh, oh, wow. Yeah, see those details and those little holes in the leaf just really bring that to light. Oh, it looks like I could just pluck it off of the page the way that stem is sticking up. Ayla over here. Very nice. I like the cross hatching in that shadow. Barbara. Lovely. And I like your value scale there as well. We have um, Hello Haiti over here. Very nice. Yes. <laughs> Going. Sorry about that. <laughs> Trying to see if there's anyone else trying to show here. We have Samantha. Oh yeah, I love how dark you're getting. Definitely, if yours is not coming to life, push those darker shadows. Just pushing an absolute black, even if your shadow on your object doesn't get that dark, make it look that dark in your drawing any, anyway. And just one spot, make it really dark like that and it will just bring it to life to have that contrast. All right, okay. awesome. Well, it is seven o'clock. Thank you all for sharing. And uh, yeah, if you post on social media, make sure to tag it with, uh, make it with Michael's or Michael's classes or tag me. And I hope to see you next week. Um, definitely, if you want to find out more about stippling and scribbling, we'll be talking about those other two shading techniques. So the stippling uh, shading technique with the dots and scribbling, which is just like it sounds. All right, thank you guys so much. Looking forward to having everyone back again. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was a great class. Thanks everyone for joining us. Bye. All right, good night.